Today, I will share how characters are made for video games and explain what to expect when you start your career as a character artist in a game studio. Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Siamak, I'm a character artist and I work in game industry. Since my last video was about character artist responsibilities, I decided to make this video because it is related to that topic. If you haven't watched it yet, please make sure to check it out. I put the link in the description. I'm gonna have to split this topic into two videos to avoid a very long video. So let's get it started. This chart shows you the steps that you need to go through as a character artist to make characters for video games and there are eight stages. First, I'm gonna share each one quickly and then later in the video I'll talk about them in more detail. All right, so let's talk about the stages. First, you need to know what type of characters you are going to make, which includes hero, psychics, NPCs, enemies, animals, creatures, and so on. Second, you need to have a concept which shows you all the visual details and colors. Concept art will also provide a reference sheet which will be useful for modeling, texturing, and material creation. After concept, you should quickly block out the character model as soon as possible without going into details. You can call this the block out stage. After the block out, you can start the hires a sculpt. Most artists enjoy sculpting more than anything, and for me, it is also the most fun part of the job as well. On the fifth stage, once the hires is approved, you will start the game topology. Hires approval comes from your lead or the art director, and in some cases, concept team will also be involved. Once the lowers is done, you need to make the UVs and bake the maps. These two will go together because you might need to adjust the UVs to get the best results when you bake. Keep in mind that sometimes you might even have to go back and do some adjustments to the lowers and the highers to get cleaner bakes. After that, on the seventh stage, you can start texturing your character in Substance Painter. Almost all studios are using Substance Painter and this is going to be PBR workflow. And here we go to the final stage. The final stage will be look development, which is going to continue all the way till the game is shipped. I didn't add LODs in this chart, but I will talk about it as I cover this topic. Also, many people ask me about hair workflow, and I'm going to have to cover that in a separate video because it's a huge topic. Before starting, make sure you have proper naming convention and folder structure in place. You need to have everything organized and this is something that will be developed early on the project and different teams in the studio will be involved in this stage. The way I organize my personal file is that I have a separate folder for each software and then I will have a data folder inside each one of these folders. This way it will be much easier for me to find my latest files. So let's talk about the stages. Stage one. Before the concept of the stage, you need to know what type of characters needs to be made. In video games, hero characters are the main focus and they have a background and a history which would reflect on the concept art and might have an impact on the pipeline. But the general idea of the pipeline is the same for all the characters. Except the hero might need special treatments in some cases such as a more complicated facial rig or a more complicated hair pipeline. Basically, anything that adds to the realism would make the process more complicated. Poly budgets are always set higher for the heroes, especially on their faces, to achieve a higher fidelity of facial expression. And you will most likely have more complicated shaders on the hero. Besides that, hero textures usually could be more high resolution. For a complicated hero character, the poly budget could be around 200,000 to 400,000 polygons, and this is really not lowers anymore comparing to the games of like PS3 and previous generations. In some cases, they could go even higher and setting the budget depends on how the memory is managed. Heroes might have special abilities which would affect the pipeline. You need to consider those abilities when you are working on a hero character. Those abilities could be climbing rocks or having superpowers like superhero characters. Animation and rigging will play a huge role when setting up the pipeline for those types of characters. It is important to keep all the deformations and movements in mind when you are working on a hero character. Superhero characters are a good example for this. To avoid facing any issues, you need to communicate properly with the concept art team, tech art team, animation team, and the design team. 
You also need to know how much the character is going to change when you progress in the game. You need to know if you can change individual armor parts like shoulder pads or gloves while you progress in the game. Because if you change parts, then it means your character is customizable and that will change the whole pipeline. In that case, you need to have a modular system in place and follow that system so that you can customize your character in the game. Basically, anything that changes the shape could affect the pipeline. Regarding the schedule, hero characters will take longer than any other characters to develop. From my experience, to finish a hero character, sometimes it can take two or three months, and in some cases might take up to six months or even more. A scheduling really depends on how complicated the character is. When I say complicated, I'm not only talking about the model or the details. Complications also come from rigging and animation and other sites. Sometimes they might even change the concept at some point and you might need to start the model from scratch. Therefore, it takes more time to make it. If you want to have customizable characters in game, then you need to create the characters in parts and the pipeline is way more complicated. There are certain limitations when it comes to customization. And customization is a big topic and I will cover it in a separate video. If you are working on a first person shooter game, then you will need to create highly detailed arms, hands and weapons for the player character because you will always see those models close up in front of the camera. Besides all of that, when it comes to hero and the main characters in the game, cutscenes and close up shots will have a huge impact on the character and you could end up updating the models and the textures just for the cutscenes. It is always the distance which defines how much work you need to put on a character and it all depends on the screen space. Basically, any characters that is going to be only seen from far away will never need as much details on the face comparing to a hero character, which will be seen close up in the cutscenes. Another character that you will have in a video game is a sidekick, or maybe there will be more than one. And those characters are usually treated like a hero. In some games, you might even get the chance to play the game using the sidekick character, or you may have some limited controls on that character without playing with it directly. Sidekick characters play a major role in the game and they should be considered a hero character when it comes to their pipeline and the quality of the work. The next type of characters are NPC characters. NPC stands for a non-player character, which is basically any character that you can control in a game and it is controlled by computer using algorithms and predefined behaviors, basically AI. Some NPC characters evolve in the game as you progress and some of them never change and just repeat the same dialogues over and over. As an example, a merchant or a quest giver is considered an NPC character. Sometimes they could even be key characters in the game and the story evolves around them. In RPG games, to save memory, NPC characters are made in parts and each part will have several textures. This way they can create lots of variations using a modular system in real time without running out of memory. Next type of characters are enemies. In RPG games, you will most likely face different types of enemies and they will level up as you progress in the game. Depending on how they level up, they will have better armors and different looks. Also, the type of enemies, their size and their mechanics could have an impact on the pipeline. Usually, they use the same rig for enemies if they are similar. This way they can avoid having extra rigs and memory can be managed better. There are always some types of unique enemies like giants for example, and they will require their own pipeline and their own rig. Enemies also could be made in parts to be part of a modular system or they could be individual looking characters. All of this depends on how the memory is managed. You should know that memory and performance are two different things. For example, if you have two unique characters with different models and a hero character in the screen, that means you are loading three unique characters into the memory. The poly budget for each character is defined by the number of characters you will have on the screen and how many unique characters are going to be loaded into the memory at the same time. If you have several unique characters on the screen at the same time, that means your budget will be more limited on the character side. Also, the performance will affect the budget. If you duplicate the same character hundreds of times and have them all in the same scene on the screen, then you will most likely end up with millions of polygons and you might have to reduce the polygons on that character to control the performance. But memory wise, you will not have any issues because there is only one character loaded into the memory and it is duplicated in the game during the runtime. This is why LODs are so important and I will talk about it in the second part of this video. If you have a modular system to create variations for enemies or any other characters, 
then you will have to cut your models in certain areas and follow specific guidelines. It will limit you a little bit, but in return you can have the option to swap parts between characters and create an army of unique looking characters. The pipeline will also change if your enemy is a creature or a robotic character. Each one of these have their own technical limitations and you need to understand it well to be able to execute the task properly. Next thing you need to sort out is gender and child characters. Most likely there will be both male and female characters in a game. This should be considered on both humans and animals. You need to have a standard body for both male and female humans. Both can also share the same topology and the same UV to save memory and time. Some studios prefer to use the same rig for both male and female to reduce the memory usage and the amount of work. And lastly, animals or creatures are also part of the game. On the animal side, there are birds, bipedal and quadrupedal animals, and they will have fur and feather, which will be a different pipeline and obviously each animal requires to have a different rig. Also, in some cases, there are obvious differences between male and female animals as you can see in this image. Regarding the creatures, they could be unique looking characters when you start the game and as you progress in the game, when they level up, you will notice that at some point their armors or models won't change anymore and only their colors, behaviors or their abilities changes. The main reason is because it takes so much time to make these characters and the second reason is because of memory management. It is always cheaper to change the color rather than having a new character made from scratch. The second stage of the pipeline is concept art. The studios always have concept art team in-house. Art director oversees the concept art and depending on the size of the game, there are people working specifically on characters, environments, props and weapons concepts. A concept artist will provide the design, colors and a reference sheet for you to give you the initial idea for modeling, texturing and look development. A reference sheet is basically containing images that concept artists use to make the concept and you can request for more references if things are not clear. Later, when you look for more references, make sure to share them with the concept team to get their approval before using them. It is important to mention that the concept is not always going to be the finalized idea. There is a chance that you might find some technical issues when you see the concept or when you start working on the model. That is why during the concept stage, you need to communicate with the concept team as a character artist and help them to understand the technical side and the limitations when it comes to working on characters for video games. Tech art team and animation team should definitely be part of the communication with the concept team. As an example, if you are going to work on a sci-fi character, there might be concerns about the design which could affect the job on the tech art side. And also the animation team might have concerns about how limited the movement on that character could be. All of that will potentially affect the direction the concept team is taking. So it is extremely important to have these communications early in the concept stage to reduce the amount of guessing and redoing. Once the concept is ready, you can search online for more references. Pinterest is my favorite site when I search for images because it usually gives me the exact images that I'm looking for. I would recommend that you use PureRef to put all the images together in one place. It is a free application and you can basically donate if you choose to, which I would recommend the donation. On the reference site, it will always be good to have an actual real reference in hand. Real references will give you a better understanding of the material. Also, remember to communicate with the game designers when the concept is being developed. I have seen many times that artists won't communicate properly with the design team and they don't take it serious enough. A character in a game without purpose won't do any good for the video game. Essentially, designers define if you will have good or a bad experience when you play the game. Designers always add specific features on characters like heroes, sidekicks, enemies, NPCs, and those features could affect the look of the character and the pipeline. So it is best to keep them in loop from start to finish. Communication will also help to define what type of tools or shaders needed in order to achieve what needs to be done for the game. If your character is growing in size and changing shape in real time, then you may need to have a totally different rigging system for that character. Basically, every challenge will bring new questions and the pipeline might change based on the solution you will find. In some cases, it would be good to communicate with the writers if you have access to them 
to basically understand the back history of the characters better. Honestly, communication is extremely important during the concept stage to avoid complications. And finally, once the concept is done, art director should approve it before you go to the next stage. After the concept stage, you should do a quick block out of the character in 3D. The main purpose of a block out model is to have a quick model with some colors on it so that it can be pushed into the game to test the whole pipeline as quick as possible. Block out models are based on the concept and will represent of what the final model is going to be, but they will not have any sort of details. Blocking out a character gives you a rough estimate of the parts that you have to make for that character and you will have a better understanding of the whole model. From there, you can estimate how many shaders and textures you may need to have. None of these estimates are final and they can change at the end. Also, blocking out the character gives you this opportunity to see it in the game as soon as possible and test if the silhouette is looking good and communicate with the art director or your lead if you think you might face any issues. On the other hand, tech art team can start rigging and testing the assets and will be able to use the block out models to identify what type of tools they will need to create. After rigging, this asset can be handed over to animation team so they can start working on the animation at the same time. Block out models could also be the earliest stages of the highest model before you go too far and you may not even need to make a separate geometry for that. Once it is all approved, character artists can move forward and continue working on the hires model. This way all the teams can work together in parallel. And I will cover the rest of the topic in my next video, which I'm planning to release after this one. In the meantime, make sure to check my last two videos as well because they are related to character art. If you guys enjoyed this topic so far, then like this video and consider subscribing to my channel. Also, make sure to turn on the notification bell to get notified when I release my next video. And that is it for today. Thank you all for watching and see you next time.